All right, good morning. Let's get started this morning. Now, this is a really cool class, right? We really want to get and understand ACI. And very importantly, we want to be able to tell the ACI story. And so that's what a lot of today will be about. And so obviously we know the whole ACI, software defined network and all that is catching fire and it's become incredibly important. All right, but I know for people in this room, we have different people coming from different backgrounds, right? And so what I'd like to do is to go ahead and start off a little bit with some learner introductions. And so the purpose of this is twofold. is one, so everybody here gets to know about everybody else, which is great. And the second is for me to also know some of your background. Because I know they're out there and we all, you know, especially being out there in sales, sales engineering, you have to know a tremendous number of products. You have to know an incredibly large Cisco product line as well as even the competitors product lines. And you have to have, to have a tremendous amount of knowledge and that can be tough. All right. So when we go through the description here, you know, your name, your company and all that, what I'm really interested in is we get to this part here. When we start talking about your background as far as Cisco, all right, in particular UCS. Are you familiar with UCS service profiles? Have a basic understanding of UCS. Are you familiar with Nexus? Have you familiar with Nexus, Nexus 7Ks, Nexus 5Ks, Nexus 2Ks? All right, and then do you have any ACI background? All right, and that's really kind of what we're looking for. So kind of let really kind of focus on that. And then really, last one, the objective, why are you here? That's the big one. Hey, why are you here? Not the big like, why are you on planet Earth? That's a whole different class. But why are you in this class today? You know, hey, I wanted to go get some free lunch. Fair enough. All right. Hey, I have a customer that's very interested in this. Or, hey, I'm encountering SDN and I'd like to be able to talk about it better. So kind of let us know what you're looking to do. All right. And so what I'd like to do is when we first talk about this is, when we think about ACI and you start hearing about it, obviously it's been a huge push by Cisco. Everybody's talking about software defined networking and ACI. And one of the questions we have is oftentimes we've been in places where a product will appear, right? Be the most important thing. And then a couple years later, that product's gone. All right. Uh, if you think we're silly, uh, what was that, Invicta? Or anybody, anybody remember the flip phone, right? The little flip camera phone that Cisco bought for hundreds of millions of dollars. Anyways, um, we want to take a look. I want you to understand the story. If we can tell the story of where we're going from, what Cisco's doing in the data center, and then where we're heading, all right, it really makes sense. And if we can tell that and tell the ACI story and people get that complete vision of where Cisco has been, where we're at today, and then where we're in the future, that's going to make a huge difference. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time on the history. And when we start talking about this, we're going to say, hey, what's going on? And you'll see when I tell this story, it's going to kind of all come together and hopefully make a lot of sense about where we're coming from all right now we're not going like back to the beginning of time obviously in this case we're going way back to the 80s what did cisco make in the 80s anybody remember yeah routers routers right but we didn't even call them routers anymore. remember what we called them right Gateways, we called them gateways, right? We had the uh, AGS, IGS, CGS, Advanced Compact Intermediate Gateway Systems, right? And so that's what we made. We made these gateways, which were routers, right? And we did incredibly well. And you go through the data center and you would see routers everywhere. I mean, Cisco just crushed in the router market. However, as great as they did in the router market, they were missing a component that was becoming very popular. Now, those of you that are old enough to remember, uh, uh, younger people, we used to have these things called hubs, all right? <laughs> but later on, they, we switched, we got this ethernet switches, right? And in the early 90s, Cisco did not have, or in late 80s, early 90s, Cisco did not have ethernet switches, and that was becoming a key component, all right? And so a choice had to be made. Cisco had to say, okay, hey, I have some options here, and what I really need to do is make a decision. Do I want to acquire a company, or do I want to go ahead and develop these internally myself? Do I want to develop it in Cisco? What do you think Cisco chose? Well, of course, today it's easy in hindsight to say Cisco chose to do an acquisition, right? But actually, at this time, Cisco had done no acquisitions. This was Cisco's 
very first acquisition. And their very first acquisition was a company called Crescendo. Now, Crescendo, that's an Italian word, all right? And part of the reason is the founders, all right? Uh, some of the founders are from Italy. And so when you take a look at Crescendo, this is where we went ahead and we acquired our Ethernet switches. Now, we know Cisco has become famous for acquisitions with over 150 acquisitions. They have acquired a ton of companies. Well, with Crescendo, they got Ethernet switches, which was huge to get those Ethernet switches, but they also acquired some key personnel. Mario Mazzola, Prem Jane, and Luca Cafario. All right. Now, Mario, Prem, and Luca were three of the big uh, founders inside of Crescendo. And they're going to be important to our story. They're going to be important to our story. Later on, a lady named Sony got involved. But we'll talk, all right, we'll worry about that later. Uh, sometimes you'll hear these people referred to inside of Cisco as MPLS. All right. But with Crescendo, what came out of Crescendo? What was the product line? that along with some other acquisitions that occurred, Grand Junction, some other current, what was the product line that Crescendo became? Right, Catalyst, right? This became the Catalyst switches, a Catalyst 5000, Catalyst 6000. And think how incredibly successful the Catalyst switches were. All right, and so the Catalyst, which we've been hugely successful, the 5,000, 6,000 series, the 6,500, I mean, we've done incredibly well with the Catalyst product line, right? By the end of the 90s, you'd walk through a data center with Cisco router, Cisco router, Cisco router, Catalyst switch, Catalyst switch, brocade, brocade, brocade. Why all that brocade stuff? What were we missing? Right, storage switches, fiber channel switches. We did not have fiber chances. And so Cisco wanted to go ahead and get in the fiber channel company. And what they wanted to be able to do is be able to develop fiber channel switches kind of with a rapid development privately without other people knowing. And that's kind of challenging for a public company. Public companies have to let people know, hey, this is what we're doing. So what they did is they funded a private company. All right. Now, what was the name of that private company they funded? Right. They funded a product called Andiamo. Right. This was called Andiamo. Again, another Italian word. All right. Mario and Luca are both from Italy. Um, one of them's from Sicily, which is somehow more Italian. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> they've created Andiamo. And what they do is they'd fund this private company, that Cisco would fund this private company. They would do all the research, all the development, get the product all completely developed. And then when it was ready, they would go ahead and they would buy back that company. This became known as a spin-in. And so there's been a number of spin-ins. We'll be looking at a few more of them. I know the new CEO says, hey, we're not doing spin-ins. But anyways, they created Andiamo. They put the same guys in charge. The guys are responsible for the Catalyst product line for developing what became their Ethernet switch product line, Mario, Prem, and Luca, they put in charge of Andiamo. And out of Andiamo, all right, what product line came out of Andiamo? Our fiber channel switches, right, which were our MDSs. Obviously, the MDS was incredibly successful. So now, basically, the same group of executives, engineers, all right, had created what became the Catalyst product line and became the MDS product line. You would think by this time, these guys would go ahead and retire, all right? But they didn't, all right? They still had more up their sleeve. So around 2008, Cisco created another company. Part of this company was the development of something called the California Project. Now, what, pro what company was the one they founded around 2008? Nuovo. Now, Nuovo was huge, right? When we look at Nuovo. Now, we take a look at Nuovo, we had a couple different products come out of Nuovo. All right. And so we think about it, the Nexus 5000 and the Cisco UCS. Now, have you ever seen a Nexus 5000 and compared it to a Cisco Fabric Interconnect? How do they look? What's the difference? That's right. They're a different color. Oh, there's actually some different goodies on the inside, but it is the same platform. They have the same platform. Cis Nexus 5000 and Cisco US are, are built on the same platform, but with different purposes. Same platform, different purposes. All right. And so this was very, very key. And so when we look at this, we say, okay, great. Um, 
we had the same platform, and they did some really cool stuff here we'll be talking about in a little bit. One of the big things happened at this time was a speed change, right? We were moving to 10 gig. Actually, when the Nexus 5000 first came out, it only supported 10 gig, didn't support 1 gig, so customers would receive this and then have nothing to be able to plug it into because they didn't have anything running 10 gigabits per second, right? So, this was cool. We went ahead, we're moving in this space. Now, what was inside of these guys, the fi inside of the, these products? All right. Well, they had they were the first switch really to have Ethernet and fiber channel inside the same box. If you think about it, though, it kind of makes sense, right? We know that with um, Crescendo, they made Ethernet switches. With Andiamo, they made fiber channel switches. With Nuovo, they smushed them together and made something that had Ethernet and fiber channel switches. All right. But let's really take a look at what came out of the Nuevo Corporation. All right, we're going to start off talking about the 5000 the UCS. We already mentioned there was a speed change going on. So we're going to look at the Nexus 5000 first, and then we'll look at UCS. Remember, same platform, different purposes. We mentioned we had a big speed change going on, going from 1 gig to 10 gigabit. All right. In addition to that, what, when we look at the Nexus 5000, what operating system did we use to manage the Nexus 5000? Right, NXOS. We used the NXOS operating system, which was fantastic, right? And so we were used to it. Now, typically when you were managing these, did you manage them typically via the command line interface or via a graphical interface? Right, we used the command line interface. Now, when I'm configuring a bunch of Nexus switches, Typically, did I configure the switches individually or did I have some central magical way to configure all the switches? Well, typically, what do we do? That's right, we typically configured box by box, right? I'd log into one box, I'd configure that Nexus switch, I'd log out. I'd log into the next box, I'd configure that Nexus switch, I'd log out. I'd log in the next switch, I'd log configure that box, and I'd log back out, all right? And so I would do a box by box or individual configuration. And lastly, it's kind of an odd question, but what type of topology could I build with a Nexus 5000? If I wanted to, could, could I take a bunch of Nexus 5000s and go ahead and put them into a circle or a triangle? Or, I could build anything I want, right? And so kind of a weird question, but we could have any topology that we wanted. Now let's compare that to UCS. On the UCS side, we still had the speed change going on, but when we want to manage UCS, all right, what tool did we use? That's kind of in the question, isn't it? What tool do we typically use to manage UCS? Well, UCS Manager. All right. UCS Manager was an awesome tool allowed us. Now, when we use, use UCS Manager, do we typically do it via a GUI or do we typically do it via the command line? Right. We can do a command line, but typically we do it, do it via the GUI. And now we have all these chassis and blades. Do we have to log in and individually configure devices, or do we have central management of these devices? We now have, of course, central management. But the last question is kind of interesting is topology-wise. All right. When we think about topology-wise, we know that UCS has more of a fixed topology. All right. When we think about UCS and its topology, we know we have a pair of fabric interconnects. Whoops. We have a pair of fabric interconnects, right? All right. That might not work so good. I have a pair of fabric interconnects. And then, of course, I have my blade chassis. And if I look at the data plane, I know that each fabric interconnect would connect to each chassis. All right, definitely not true spine and leaf, but sort of spine and leafish, right? So it's kind of important. We did have a little bit of that spine and leaf type idea going on. But how successful was this for us? Well, obviously this was incredibly successful, right? In a short period of time, they became the number one blade server in the US. But when we think about it, I look at all these features, UCS manager, C GUI, CLI, Central, I'm like, hey, those are amazing, but it's really, not what made UCS so amazing. What was the real magic behind UCS? Yeah, I could see some of that. Some of that. Right, right, profiles, service profiles, right? Remember, service profiles allowed me to logically define 
my compute in software. I could logically define it in software and push it down to programmable hardware. I'm going to say that again. I could logically define the compute in software and push it down to programmable hardware. That was magical. All right. I could create these same profiles. I could go ahead. I could create them and I could push them down and I could use them again and again and again. It completely changed things. All right. As a matter of fact, when a customer would order gear, I wouldn't even need to wait to build this config, right? I could go ahead, I could build this config in software. Use like the the, uh, the emulator, right? Go ahead, build his complete config, and then when his gear arrives, go ahead and take that software configuration and put it onto his hardware. And so this was amazing. So what we're doing is we're defining the compute in software. We're defining the compute in software, which is also known as software defined compute or SDC. Okay, so this was awesome, right? So UCS was huge. So you think about UCS, we know that it came from a company that had two different products with the same platform, two different purposes. And and, and XOS, we know the Nexus 5000, what it allowed us to do. And then we had the whole UCS mode. And UCS really changed things because now I could logically define things in service profiles. And so for example, if a blade would fail inside of UCS, was that a big deal? No, because everything that was d defined what that blade was was stored in software. I could take out that piece of hardware, that broken blade, put in a new blade, and then take that software definition and push it down to that programmable hardware. And that was magical. So you would think that Mario, Prem, Luca, these guys would have to be done by now. But they still had one more up their sleeve, right, in, in CMA. All right. When we started thinking about NCMA, again, this was another privately funded company. Okay. And what came out of this company are two things. This is the Nexus 9000 and the Nexus 9000 in two different modes. One platform, two different modes, right? We have the Nexus 9000 in an XOS mode and the Nexus 9000 in ACI mode. Once again, the same engineering staff that built UCS was brought over. The same management team that built UCS was brought over. All right. And so what we see is we're going to go ahead, we're going to have a very similar idea. That slide needs to go away. All right. And so when we want to compare these two modes, David, you want to remove this slide. All right. When we compare these two different modes, let's compare it in XOS mode. So we had the Nexus 9000 in XOS mode. Once again, we had a speed change going on. And this time, though, the speed change was going from 10 gigabits to 40 gigabits, right? Actually, it's kind of fun. In some places, we have customers that are, their inner switch links are going from 1 gig, and they're upgrading now to 40 gig, you know? And so we have some customers that are still at 1 gig. How many of you guys still have customers at 1 gig? But then now they have a choice. They can do 10 gig or 40 gig, and 40 gig only costs a little more. Kind of like when you go into 7-Eleven, right? You go into 7-Eleven, and for 99 cents, you get a 32-ounce soda. But for $1.19, you can walk out with a vat of soda, right? And so we have people actually going from 1 gig to 40 gig, which is kind of fun. Okay. What is our management for 9K in XOS mode? It's kind of in the title, of course. What is our management software? Well, of course, it's in XOS. And typically, do we manage these via a graphic environment or a command line? Of course, command line. And just like before, do we configure these individually box by box, or do we have some central management for most of our environments? We typically do box by box. We configure them individually. And I can put in an XOS mode, I can build triangle squares. I can build any shape I want. It doesn't matter what shape I build. All right. I can do absolutely any topology. Now let's compare that to ACI mode. When I think about ACI mode, I still have the same speed change going on. But now what is my management software? What do I use to manage ACI? Anybody know? Right. The APIC, the application policy infrastructure controller or the APIC. We're going to find the APIC really just looks like a C-series server with some special software, but we have these APIC. The APIC is going to be our management. And when we manage the APIC, do we typically do this via GUI or typically via CLI? Right, we typically do it via GUI. All right. And now individually configure boxes or do we now have central configuration? We now have central configuration. And lastly, can we have any topology or have kind of a fixed topology? 
we have a fixed topology. What I want to point out to you is if we go back and you think about when we compared the Nexus 5K to UCS, we had the exact same chart minus 10 gig to 40 gig. You guys have done this before. You have been through this process before. When you had to teach people about UCS, well, now you're going to have to teach them about ACI. We talk about having a fixed topology. Well, in this case, what type of fixed topology do we have? Right, a spine and leaf topology, sometimes referred to as a clos topology, CLOS, named after the gentleman that developed it. So we've done this before, all right, but really, what makes ACI so special? Well, there's a lot of things, I agree. I can think of all kinds of cool things there, but remember, what made UCS so special was the idea of profiles. What's gonna make ACI so special is the idea of profiles. We're going to be able to logically define the network and software and push that down to programmable hardware. Say that again. Logically define the network and hardware, push that down to programmable, largely define the network and software, push it down to programmable hardware. This is huge. All right. This is huge. This is going to allow us to go ahead and define our network completely logically. We're going to use profiles. We're going to use something called application profiles. And with application profiles, I'll be able to define my network and software. And I'll be able to have what we call a software defined network. And so this is really key. The idea of being able to define things and be able and, and logically independent of the underlying physical gear. I define my network and software. I push it down to programmable hardware, just like UCS. And just like UCS, and UCS, did everybody understand service profiles right away? No, of course not, all right? They did not understand service profiles, all right? Um, matter of fact, you go on some customer sites and you would see a service profile name like Blade 3, uh, Chassis 4, Blade 3 for the service profile name and realize they didn't understand service profiles, all right? But hey, the check cleared, so we were good. We're gonna have to educate them about application profiles just like we educate them by service profiles. So we're gonna have to do a few things we have to educate. We already talked about the spine and leaf topology a little bit and we talked about the service profiles. Well, just like we've done service profiles before, Right? We, or profiles before, we're used to profiles, now we're just doing profiles based on the network instead of the compute. Have we actually done the spine and leaf thing before? Have you been selling spine and leaf? Yeah, actually, you might surprise yourself, you have been selling spine and leaf, you just may have not known it. Let me give you an example. All right, the Nexus 7K. Love the Nexus 7K, all right. I actually have one of these at our office. Uh, with a Nexus 7K, you know, we have different one, obviously a bunch of different models. Here's a 7010. Um, when I want to provide access ports to be able to plug servers in, so I want to be able to provide access ports for servers, what do I plug into the front of the Nexus 7K? Right, line cards. I plug line cards in the front. These line cards are forward facing, and that's what I'm going to be able to plug all my servers into. Now, do the line cards, all right, do we cable them together? I know sometimes we do weird VDC stuff, but when we want for them to be able to talk to each other, how do the line cards actually communicate to each other? Well, we have to plug something into the back of the 7K that allows the line cards to talk to each other. And what do we plug into the back of the 7K to allow the line cards to talk to each other? Right, fabric modules. Now, when we plug fabric modules in, all right, we're going to find fabric modules connect to each of the line cards. All right, fabric modules at ASIC level communicate to each of the line cards, which is great. Now, do the fa do we cable the fabric modules together? No, of course not. If the fabric modules need to talk to each other, they do it via the line cards. So inside the 7K, we already have been using a spine and leaf topology. All right, so we've been using the spine and leaf topology. So this has been very cool. All right. Now, when I want to be able to manage this thing, what type of cards do I install into the 7K to be able to manage it? Right, supervisors. I install my supervisor modules, right? I put a pair of supervisors. Now, why do I have two supervisor modules? Why? Right. 
if one fails, the other one takes over, right? So we have a, we have fault tolerance. If one would fail, the other one would fall over, fail over. So this is our basic topology for a Nexus 7K. We look at the Nexus 7K topology. It's very cool, right? We have a spine and leaf topology, and then we have the supervisors for management. Well, what if I need more access ports for servers? What do I add? Well, if I need more access ports for the servers, I simply add more line cards. What if I need more bandwidth between the line cards? What do I add? Right, fabric modules. All right, so we add fabric modules. So very cool. So this is what you've been selling for years. You have been selling spine and leaf for years. You just may have not known it. And just informationally wise, if you take a look at the 9K and look at the ASICs as well, the 9K, uh, the modular 9Ks use a spine and leaf topology as well. So great, what does this have to do with us? Well, let's think about the Nexus Cisco ACI. With the Cisco ACI, if we want to provide access ports for servers to be able to plug into, what kind of switches do we add in ACI? Do we add spines or do we add leaves if we want servers to be able to plug into them? Right, we add in the leaves. So we add in our 9K switches. 9K switches, these are going to be our leaf switches. The leaf switches you're allowed to plug things into, like servers and other devices, right? You can plug firewalls or whatever. They plug in the leaf. But if you want these leaves to be able to talk to each other, all right, how do I, what do I need to allow these leaves to talk to each other? Right, spines. I need spine switches. And so my spine switches connect. Now notice the spine switches do not connect to each other. They only connect with the leaves. The only thing allowed to connect to an ACI leaf switch is, excuse me, the only thing allowed to connect to an ACI spine switch is a leaf, nothing else. So if you have a big old 7, 7K out there and you want to plug it into this environment, it plugs into the leaf. It does not plug into the spine. The only thing that plugs into the spine is an ACI leaf. All right. And so this is our environment. This is very cool. This is our spine and leaf environment. The spines don't cable together and the leaves don't cable directly together, right? If the spines want to talk to each other, they do it via the leaves. The leaves want to talk to each other, they do it via the spines. But how do we manage this? What device are we going to use to manage this environment? Right, the Apex, the Apex. I said the Apex are basically C220 servers, C-series servers with special software. There's a thing installed called a trusted protection module that has special certificates installed at the factory. So you can't build it yourself. You buy these pre-built appliances and this is what we're gonna manage. So ACI, we're gonna use these Apex to be our management or control. So look at this, if you can think about the 7K and you look at the ACI, we see a lot of similarities. One of the easiest way to think about the ACI, when you think about ACI fabric, is don't think of the ACI fabric in this case as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight separate devices. Think of it as one logical switch. Think of it as one big switch. The difference is now is that the network is kind of acting as the backplane, right? The network's fast now to be able to act as a backplane. Okay. And so ACI is going to behave like one big switch. We'll create a policy in ACI. It'll affect the entire environment, all the individual components that make up ACI. All right. And so we mentioned the Apex themselves. The Apex are just C-series servers running special software. Now, when I look at this picture, I see I have two supervisors over here, and I have three Apex. Hmm. That's interesting. Why do I have three Apex? Well, let's compare it compared to UCS, right? We're familiar in Cisco UCS, we have two fabric interconnects, right? And how does that work? Are they both in charge at the same time? No, right? One's in charge and one's on standby, right? Uh, management wise. And it, they're active, active on the data plane, of course, but one's in charge and one's on standby. If the one that is in charge fails and dies, what happens? Well, of course, the other one takes over, right? So the other one that was, in, when that one dies, the one that was in standby mode will come up and take in charge, which is how it's supposed to behave. But what happens if the one that's charged is fine and the one that is the standby is just standing there and they lose communication? So now the secondary thinks the primary has died. And so now, boom, he's going to make himself. We're going to have two in charge at the same time. So in that scenario, we have two people that think they're in charge at the same time. Anybody here ma married? Anyways, all right, so they both think they're in charge. What's this known as? Right, split brain scenario, split brain scenario. We have two in charge and can cause some problems. ACI, simple solution. 
with three A picks. All right, if we want to make a change, we have must have a majority. All right, we have to have a majority, that's all. So if I want to make a change, two of the three have to agree to that change. If I only have one, all right, and then it's only read only. It's so simple, right? So we have three. Now we can actually do more A picks. You can actually technically go up to 31, all right? The next valid number after three is five, but just keep it very simple. We have three A picks, all right? And so we keep three copies of the database, and to make a change, we have to have two of the three have to agree, all right? They have to have a majority. If you're by yourself, you're a minority, and you can't make a change, you're read only. So that's why we have three different A picks. So we have this great environment, right? We have this great environment and we can go ahead, we can do this. We, we have the spine and leaf topology, which is very cool. All right. We also have the uh, APIC to manage it. But why are people so interested in SDN? All right. Well, if you think about it, all right, automation. People want to automate. If you go on to, how many people have used like Amazon EC2? If you go onto Amazon EC2 and you want to deploy a virtual machine, how long does that take? Yeah, super fast, right? You can deploy a server crazy fast. It includes the server, the operating system, the compute, the storage, the security, all that stuff, right? Actually, the longest time to go ahead and deploy it on ACI sometimes is entering your credit card number. So it can take it super fast. In the, our own data centers, we want to get that level of automation. We want to become super automated. All right, we want to get to that automation. And we do have some things that we're very good at automating. If you think about virtualization, virtual machines, if you have a virtual machine template and I say, hey, create 20 virtual machines, you can click a button and then as fast as your storage is, you can roll out 20 virtual machines. All right. If you have a Cisco UCS a service profile template, I say, hey, go ahead and roll out a bunch of uh, blades. You can go ahead and you can easily roll out 20, 30 blades. All right. If I have a LUN, all right, inside the storage, I say, hey, I need 40 copies. I'm going to roll out 40 lines. You can click a button and roll out 40 lines. All that is easy to be automated. However, if I go to the networking department, I say, hey, I need you to roll out 20 subnets. Uh-oh. All right. And so you, how do we do that? Well, hopefully in about 10 to 15 minutes, you can schedule your first meeting. Right? You start arguing about what VLANs are in use, what subnets are available, what masks we should use, all this other kind of stuff. We cannot automate. People are now using tools. All right, People are using tools like OpenStack to automate their entire environment. They're using tools like Azure. They're using tools like Clicker, UCS Director, different tools to automate their environment. And everything automates well except the network. I mean, think about, you know, give you an example of a concept, just a very simple concept, is if we want to deploy VLANs, right? Well, let's compare that to UCS. In UCS, if I want to deploy a bunch of MAC addresses, right, or excuse me, if I want to deploy a bunch of blades, I know that every single UCS blade has to have a separate MAC address. Well, I don't have to sit there and type in MAC addresses, so we know that in UCS, what are we going to do? Well, in UCS, we're going to go ahead and create a pool of MAC addresses, and then when we deploy a service profile, it will grab an available MAC address from a pool. It allows me to automate that deployment. Similarly, in ACI, when I'm deploying VLANs, I'm actually going to create a pool of VLANs. And when I need a new VLAN, all right, it's automatically going to grab one out of that pool. And so again, this is the type of automation. Because when people automate, they want to be able to use orchestration tools. All right. We don't want you we don't want to have to log into 10 different tools to deploy a server. All right. I want to be able to log into one environment and automate the deployment of a server so that I can go ahead and I can use some cool tools here. I can use like vRealize. All right. I can use Azure, UCS Director, all these different types of tools to be able to automate. And so in a lot of environments, you're going to find on a day to day basis, your admins won't normally be going into the APIC. Right. Why? Because they'll be going into OpenStack. And now OpenStack is going to communicate down and configure and manage the APIC, right? Microsoft Azure is going to communicate down to the APIC. All right. UCS Director or Clicker is going to communicate down until you can use your different automation tools. All right. And that's really the key here is that the reason it's so important for software defined networks to be able to automate, to be programmable, is that we can integrate them as part of a complete solution. And so they can click a button and say, hey, I want to deploy 
X, Y, and Z, and in the background, that can be fully automated without human intervention, which minimizes our risk, reduces our OPEX, right? We really want to try to get that OPEX cost down. Automation's the way to do it. All right. And so to accomplish that on the networking side, we use software defined networks. With software defined networks now, instead of having individual box by box management where I log into 20 different boxes, I now can log into a central point of configuration. All right. Our control plane has been separated out. Our control plane is in the APIC, right? Where we can go through and do define our profiles. And this is going to allow us to be much more agile, be able to change, to get more into a DevOps type environment. So the idea behind ACI is we're going to be able to logically define our network. We're going to be able to go ahead and have this programmable infrastructure to go ahead and be able to create these logical policies. We're going to create the policy in software and push it down to this programmable hardware. And one of the big things we want to be able to do is reuse policies. Be able to reuse policies again and again. All right. It's really hard to reuse network configurations. I've been doing networking for a long time. One of the most common things we do as network engineers, of course, is a very technical thing known as cut and paste, right? Because what do we do? We copy it in a notepad, but because every single, th every site's different, has different VLAN IDs, has different IP addresses, we have to change the config. We want to be able to have reusable policies. Having that reusable policy is going to make things work faster, more efficient, and make things more secure. And that's going to result in us having a true cost savings. Being able to get that OPEX way down. All right. Being able to get that OPEX way down because a lot of this will be automated. All right. And so that is one of the keys behind the whole SDN idea. And so we take a look here. The idea is we'll be able to do all this automation. All right. So with the APIC, the Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, that cluster, said by default it's going to be three of these C-series servers, is going to be programmable. We're going to be able to access and manage it via other tools. Okay. And so what does that get us? Well, we have the ACI with a programmable fabric, and that's going to net us with a programmable network, right? We're going to have a very, ACI is going to give us the truly automated all right, and really allow us to do true automation so we don't have to configure boxes device by device. If we think about t t configuration today, today when I want to deploy an application, I log into this box and I go ahead and I set up these interfaces. I log into this box, I set up these interfaces. I go and I create an access control list and I apply it to the appropriate interfaces inbound out, but I do all that kind of stuff. Well, I want to be able to automate that, right? I want to make that much easier. And take a look, when you show up on a customer site, this is kind of what the config looks like. That's really hard to document and troubleshoot. With ACI, we're going to do everything logically. It's a much simpler environment, all right? And as you create your configurations, it makes it very easy to deploy an application. And what we're going to find is really cool, is with ACI, we'll be able to create an application, we'll be able to deploy it. A few years later, when that application is done, we can go ahead and remove that application, and then everything gets cleaned up behind itself in the network. Very different than uh, this environment, right? In this environment, when a new application comes out, we add all kinds of lines to the access control list. Three years later, when that application goes away, what do we do to the access control list? Right, nothing, right? We're afraid to touch the access control list. And access control lists just grow and grow. We don't have very good lifecycle management for applications. Everybody's afraid to change the access control list. I'm guilty as well, right? I'm, a, you know, hey, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? With ACI, we'll have much better lifecycle management. And that's really going to help us solve some problems. And so that we'll be able to go ahead and a lot of the issues, because we are ensuring a consistent, optimized deployment, we'll be able to go ahead and ensure that we have efficient equipment usage, configuration, all these different things that's really going to help us save. And so the idea is that we're moving from configuring individual devices and we're now going to be able to go ahead and define a logical policy. I want to be able to define a logical policy for my network and be able to push it down to the programmable hardware and I want to be able to reuse that policy again and again. Software defined networks are going to be the key that allows me to automate. And Cisco ACI is the premier software-defined network. Thank you very much.